Welcome to What's Up Wednesday. My name is Craig Mackay, your host. Our show today is about intelligent cities, also known as smart cities. Projects for intelligent cities are a great opportunity for management consultants to apply our skills as advisors, strategists, innovators, and leaders. Thanks for being here today. I hope everyone had a great summer and uh, is in good health as we strive to get back to some kind of normal, some kind of wonderful. Let's remember the lessons from the past and enjoy each moment as we move forward. That's my philosophy and rock and roll reference for the day, I promise. Uh, I actually enjoy doing the What's Up Wednesday digital series. Really happy to get the fall uh, on its way here, started up. Uh, super appreciate everyone's input and participation. Glad to see you all again. Um, super lineup for the fall. In October, changes in change management with Louise Harris and Don Marie Turner. A couple of members across Canada will be talking about the change management industry and how things have changed. On November 9th, uh, we will discuss cybersecurity and how to protect yourself from ransomware with Marcus Triano. And on the 14th of December, exploring Canada's entrepreneurship ecosystem with Kayla Isabel from Startup Canada. The What's Up Wednesday digital series is brought to you by the Institute of Certified Management Consultants of Ontario in cooperation with CMC Canada. If you're a guest today, so glad you could make it, consider a full-time membership. There are many benefits such as competitive and comprehensive business insurance, access to IRAP funds under the Management Advisory Service Program, and an internationally recognized certification that can open doors for doing business in the United States, as well as many other countries. To learn more, visit our website at cmc-canada.ca. Find out how to join and earn your CMC designation. Another new benefit is our pro bono program. Talk about paying it forward. We actually are now looking for some called consultants to fill in a few opportunities that are lined up you can help provide benefits to your community that might otherwise not be available. The need for help has increased due to the COVID pandemic, but funding cuts, reduced donations, staff shortages, they've taken a toll. You can use your professional skills to make an impact, to go beyond donating or volunteering. Anybody can work at a charity auction, but not everyone has the superpowers or skill sets of a CMC to help with governance, strategic planning, change management, IT assets, business case development. Gain experience, develop new skills, learn new insights. Maybe you can expand your experience by working on an interesting project or interacting with a new type of client. You can even earn CPD points. Most importantly, work with your local NPO and business communities. You'll boost your reputation, create goodwill. People will see you in action doing good deeds. Pay it forward. A few housekeeping rules for today. Uh, stay on mute, put your questions in the chat. I will go through those questions and ask them during the Q&A portion of the show, 25 minutes from now or 26 minutes from now. Uh, the show is recorded. It will be made available on the CMC Canada YouTube channel and members will receive a PDF copy of today's deck. Welcome once again to What's Up Wednesday. I'm your host, Craig Mackay. Thanks for being here. I'd like to acknowledge the lands of the Indigenous people today here in Ottawa, where I am located. I acknowledge the Algonquin people and Algonquin lands and our gratitude for the beautiful outdoors. Our guest speaker in Toronto wishes to acknowledge the traditional territory of many nations, including Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashinabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Cities across Canada and globally are in urgent need of solutions to make them more efficient and to bring in new revenue streams. To solve problems related to climate change, hopelessness and homelessness, safer roads, safer neighborhoods, more efficient public transportation and many other areas just waiting for a new idea. There are all sorts of funding sources out there to help accomplish these goals. Our guest speaker, Natasha Apolonova, will present two case studies on intelligent cities to demonstrate the mechanisms at play in this strategic area for business opportunity. 
Natasha is a management consultant, PMP, policy and government relations expert. She has held senior policy and advocacy roles with the Toronto Board of Trade. Natasha has held consulting roles in economic development, market intelligence and enterprise risk planning at BDO, IHS Market, TD Bank, Deloitte and Tech Nation. Natasha's current role is a co-founder of a boutique management consulting firm, Sigma Helix. Natasha holds a master's in arts in business economics from Wilfrid Laurier University. She's also a certified economic developer with the Economic Development Association of Canada. Welcome, Natasha. It's great to see you again. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today and uh, to speak to the audience on the topic of intelligent cities, of course, otherwise known as smart cities, and really present uh, to you some ideas in terms of how we can all together navigate new opportunity in the uh, post-COVID-19 uh, world. So before uh, I, I give you kind of a, the overview of today's presentation, I wanted to acknowledge a very sad event that transpired last week, the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Of course, she is um, Queen of Canada and she is the head of state. She was the head of state for Canada. I personally have admired her, um, her road for over, you know, over probably the last four years. Um, but of course, she had enormous impact over the past seven decades. And um, one of the elements that I wanted to mention is, of course, I learned about her history through the Netflix show known as The Crown. I'm sure many of you on the line uh, have seen this show. It's a great show. Uh, but one of the elements that really resonated uh, for me, and I wanted to include this element here in this presentation, um, is her quote. And her quote is, uh, relates to uh, the importance of hard work and dedication. Giant leaps often start with small steps. So I think it's important uh, to know. And uh, the other quote, and I just, I don't necessarily have it projecting on the screen, but I wanted to mention because for many of us, the impact of COVID-19 has been uh, enormous and had a huge toll on our lives. So um, she said uh, that when life seems hard, the courageous do not lie down and accept defeat. Instead, they are all the more determined to struggle for a better future. With this, I would like to give you a quick overview in terms of the topics that, that I'm going to discuss today. I will start by making the case for continuous learning. Without intelligent management consulting or intelligent management consultants, we cannot have intelligent cities. So I'll make the case for continuous learning as a key to, prof to professional growth and networking. I will outline key challenges for our cities today. I will talk about intelligent cities and I will look to define it. I know it's a very, uh, still a very ambiguous definition, but uh, I think it's the best that I can do for this presentation. Um, and I will focus on two specific case studies. I will talk about transit el electrification and how that connects to intelligent cities. And I'll also talk about government services, digit digitization, and complex procurement processes, and how management consultants can help navigate those processes. I will then summarize our discussion, and we can uh, definitely engage in a, I'm sure, very exciting uh, Q&A session moderated by Craig. So let me start by talking a little bit more about continuous learning and why I think this is very important. Uh, for, uh, for us, for management consultants. Um, I spent uh, about a decade of my career in uh, consulting uh, services sector. I also spent about, public, uh, about 10 years in public and policy uh, and advocacy uh, roles. But one thing I can, I can share is that no matter what, what position you have or what role you have, the importance of continuous learning. Gone are the days when we simply just show up uh, in the room, you know, to, to learn about the new course. We have a notebook and a pencil and we just sort of learn for that instruction coming from the instructor. Uh, we're now at the time when we can actually have access to continuous learning 24 seven from the comfort of our homes. And we can enroll in a multiple, a variety of different programs. Why is this important? I think it really helps um, to really upskill and reskill. Many sectors are changing. Uh, we know, you know, for one, automotive and parts and aerospace, but many others are changing. 
So we constantly need to stay on top of, of those trends. Uh, we, as a, a developed country in, in, uh, in the world, OECD, uh, we, we face many different challenges, including aging population. Uh, we're putting a lot of effort on workforce renewal and immigrant integration into our Canadian economy. Um, the targets for immigration have been raised significantly. I believe now it sits at 450,000 uh, people coming to Canada every year. And of course, that requires a lot of wraparound support and a lot of integration and providing uh, critical skill sets uh, to new immigrants to Canada. And that's really important. Um, one other element that I think is, is very interesting uh, for the trends in, in essentially continuous learning industry, public sector employment in Canada accounts for one out of five employed Canadians. And so this sector is really important in, in terms of their habits, in terms of their interest in continuous learning and micro-credentials. And of course, th this, this number will help shape um, uh, micro-credentials market in Canada. And of course, other things like digitization, massive amounts of data that we generate on a day-to-day -day basis. How do we store and access this data? Role of cutting edge technology like AI and cloud in really helping us to support the future of Canada and ensure that a Canadian economy is prosperous and productive. So I just wanted to mention that uh, from the micro credential perspective, uh, the trends that we see further have been further accelerated by the pandemic um, is that many institutions across Canada, universities and colleges now offer micro credential training uh, there are many different views on what that is, but in terms of just a quick definition, micro-credential is really awarded for completion of short program that is focused on a discrete set of competencies, uh, knowledge, skills, and attributes, and some, sometimes related to other credentials. I think what is really important is that Canadians can have access to a variety of different uh, micro-credential programs from the comfort of their home. Typically, it corresponds to the uh, skill sets that are related to their jobs, to their industries. They usually, uh, um, universities and colleges provide accredited training. Uh, they're issued by university uh, in Canada or college in Canada, and of course, they're standardized. And so I, I would really encourage, I think the call to action here is really encourage you to stay um, on top of these opportunities, I, for one, engaged in a, in a BMP uh, prep course during this pandemic. I'm considering other courses, but I've also taken a lot of training with respect to proposal writing. And all of it was done out of the comfort of my home and uh, really having the ability to get access to online training and then opportunity to ask questions, again, in an interactive way, but from the comfort of my home. So being resilient, staying on top of trends uh, is very critical for the past pandemic recovery. So key challenges for cities today, um, number, number of them, uh, we, we've, we've seen a lot of structural challenges that cities in Canada have been facing. Um, as you can see from this chart uh, from OECD, uh, the numbers are a bit dated, but I think they're still very relevant uh, to today's reality. Uh, Canada relies heavily on property-related taxes. And of course, we're not alone. Uh, other countries like Australia, New Zealand, US also rely only on property taxes. Um, but there are many other European examples where we see that they're starting to diversify uh, their revenues and they're able to levy sales taxes like the case of US, a mix of taxes in Spain and income taxes and personal uh, uh, business and, and personal income taxes, uh, such as the case of Germany and Switzerland. I think it's important because uh, our cities, and I have to acknowledge a bit of a sort of a bias or um, experience that I've had is really for the Toronto region, in the Toronto region area. So 28 municipalities in the Tron greater Toronto area. Um, so here in Toronto, we have only three sources of revenue, property, land transfer and billboard, and other taxes, unfortunately, have not been, um, have not been passed through the legislation. 
So essentially, cities like large metropolitan areas are now facing uh, many different uh, requirements. For example, they are responsible for the state of good repairs for transit and social housing and many different social services. But their property, or sorry, their revenue um, opportunities are fairly limited. And of course, if we combine it uh, with uh, the post-pandemic uh, situation related to the fact that um, we're not able to quite get back to where we were before the pandemic uh, with respect to the user fees, like transit fees or parking fees, uh, that further complicates uh, the matter. At the same time, because of our rapidly growing population, and I have to be very careful here because, of course, rapidly growing population is, is a good uh, story Canada-wide. We, we have to grow population because of, uh, of our demographic and aging, aging demographic situation. But at the same time, many new immigrants actually end up settling in large metropolitan areas like Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, and Calgary. And that creates a lot of pressures on the city governments to continue to provide more services and to expand transit and keep the state of good repair bill in, in good condition. And see here I just included a number, I, I think it's, it's a probably, we're probably low-balling here, 23 billion for the state of good repair in Toronto, uh, about 50 billion for all Ontario municipalities. So that just gives you a sense that beyond uh, opportunities to generate revenue uh, and, uh, and responsibilities to, to really having to pay for growing population and growing needs, we're also facing massive um, investment opportunities in, in state of good repair and new uh, infrastructure. This is just a quick chart to showcase, I mean, the data is, here's a little bit dated. This is as of April 2022. Um, so this is this data is the Toronto Census metropolitan area. We're looking basically at a number of different uh, districts in the city of in in the Toronto Census metropolitan area. What we see here that relative to where we were before the pandemic, we still haven't quite recovered to that level. In fact, if you're looking at the financial district, uh, the volume of visitors is significantly below where we were in February of 2022. In respect to spending, again, patterns are pretty similar, um, not quite back uh, to where we were before the pandemic. So of course, that what that means is that not only are we facing rising pressures to provide uh, services to our citizens uh, by munis municipal government, we're also not able to generate user uh, fees um, and essentially replenish user fees that we were able to basically get before the pre-pandemic. Um, all of this is important, this, this context is very important because that really makes uh, a good solid business case for intelligent or smart cities that attempt to use information and communication technology to improve operational efficiency, share information with public and provide a better quality of government and citizen services. And of course, I, I think the other very important element, and I spent a lot of time debating this definition when I was at the, at the Toronto Region Board of Trade, um, intelligent and smart cities, they really have to tackle key public policy issues, such as, you know, poverty, I think Craig mentioned this, homelessness, but for the purpose of this presentation, I will just focus on two specific uh, case studies, um, and I just I wanted to make sure that this is not all inclusive. This is more of um, based on my experience of what I've done when I was working uh, for the Chamber of Commerce and when I was working in consulting. These are the types of examples that I came across. And so those examples are related to transit electrification. As I mentioned, I'll define it in a, in a few moments. And government services digitization and com complex procurement processes. So just to quickly summarize, summarize the context for the next uh, few slides is that we are facing pressures, fiscal pressures on our cities. Uh, cities need to deliver better services uh, for Canadians. And at the same time, they have very limited uh, revenue potential to be able to pay uh, for those uh, services, let alone a state of good repair 
capital expansion and social housing. On every $1 that is being generated in sales taxes uh, from Canadians today, only 10 cents actually end up going to our government. So that's, that's the size of the problem. Intelligent City, I believe, is one of the solutions. Uh, so for management consultants, I think there are three different areas um, that are very critical and can help. Uh, to really can really help uh, tr transform cities to become more intelligent and smart. In those three areas that I have identified, they are related to strategy and stakeholder engagement. That's area number one. Area number two is related to business case analysis. And again, I'll explain it later for, for my case studies. But that continuous uh, opportunity to make uh, a really solid business case uh, analysis and need to, to showcase that the government or the private sector can really support with an investment and be able to generate uh, a return and support the funding applications. What we see right now across Canada, there are multiple sources of funding available at provincial, federal and municipal uh, levels of government and management consultants can really help navigate those opportunities uh, by supporting clients, whether they are cities or you know, other sort of private sector groups, but they can really help support with, with funding applications and uh, finding those opportunities uh, through public procurement uh, uh, websites. So Sandra, I think at this point, we wanted to also make sure that we, we have an opportunity to engage with the audience. Uh, we wanted to ask you uh, to provide a quick, uh, quick response um, to this question. Uh, we're trying to understand your level of involvement with intelligent cities and innovation projects uh, in Canada and also in, uh, sorry, in, in uh, Canada. Um, so if you could uh, please uh, respond, that would be great just so that we know, or, you know, the audience, um, how is the audience faring today? Um, so interestingly, um, we see that uh, majority of our participants today uh, essentially two thirds <laughs> are not uh, currently involved uh, in, in intelligent cities. And this is why we, we have this presentation. This is why we're making the case that this is something that uh, is, uh, is happening right now. And um, it's really critical that um, management consultants are able to stay on top of these trends. And there are many different opportunities to assist um, municipalities for one, but also other uh, levels of government uh, in areas that I outline on this slide. Okay, so for transit electrification, um, I think what, uh, some of you may be surprised that in Canada uh, we we have very we have set very ambitious climate change objectives, and uh, we uh, all I think even at a, at an individual level we're very conscious about the impact of environments on, on our economy, on our day-to-day -day lives. And what we do know from the data, I think it's available from Statistics Canada, is that public transit and personal uh, car transit uh, and freight uh, transit accounts for nearly one third of greenhouse gas emissions. And so if we're really serious about impacting a climate change in a, in a positive way, one opportunity that we should be exploring and uh, across municipalities, across all of Canada, across all the provinces and territories is electrifying our transit. And um, one interesting ob observation, I've done uh, several case studies, uh, business case uh, studies for transit agencies in Alberta and Ontario. And I was very surprised uh, to see that uh, we, we still run diesel trains, you know, we still have diesel buses. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, it's not necessarily only Canada, Canada not alone in, in that problem. I think there are many other cities in the US primarily, but also in, um, in Asia where they just still are relying on diesel as the source of, of energy. Europe, of course, is, is uh, very much ahead, but still is in the process of transition. Um, so 
I, I just wanted to kind of highlight the fact that, yes, the it seems to most of us on this call that the economic case uh, for electrification of public transit or personal transit is there. Uh, but then yet we are nowhere near where we should be by now and many different pilot project opportunities are taking place across Canada. But the size of the matter is that, uh, you know, out of 15,000 buses in Canada, we only have about 160 that are currently electric. By 2025, uh, we need to be at 33% of our uh, buses should become electric. And by 2030, about one out of two should become electric. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very big opportunity. Um, I think it's also not only to make sure that we can help municipalities uh, hit the environmental objectives, but it's also a personal uh, opportunity to have, you know, influence and to have social impact uh, out of your work. Um, something I wanted to just kind of throw here just to say like, look, this isn't Canada alone problem. Many others in particular, uh, this is the person who heads um, new mobility units uh, in Berlin, in Berlin, uh, uh, the, the public transit agency out of Berlin. They are at about over 60% uh, that they have been able to electrify the transit, yet they still see this opportunity as, as daunting. And it's really a marathon at a sprint pace for them to hit the climate change object objectives by 2030. So we're not alone, but yet further, you know, other sort of transit agencies, other countries seem to be uh, moving forward at a much faster pace than we are. If we think about personal uh, automobiles, um, what's interesting here is that we, uh, as Canadians, we, we really are excited about the opportunity of owning uh, the next car uh, as EV, as opposed to internal combustion engine. In fact, according to KPMG survey conducted in the summer of 2022, we know that 71 out of 100 Canadians, in fact, would consider buying their, uh, their vehicle as EV uh, for the next uh, purchase. However, 79 out of 100 won't consider an EV unless it can run at least 400 kilometers on a fully charged battery. So I think it's, it's a very interesting fact that we are very much ready to move forward with adopting EVs, yet we are not able to do that because we don't necessarily have the opportunity to charge our cars. Uh, and have conveniently uh, to have access to conveniently located public charging uh, stations. So I know uh, from the city of Toronto perspective, and you know we, we know that several agencies, including Toronto Parking Authority, including Toronto Hydro, are working on this an electrification strategy and uh, building out uh, opportunities for uh, public uh, EV charging infrastructure across the city. However, it's again, the, the task is daunting and it's daunting from the point of view of having available funding and also deciding on where about um, those EV charging infrastructure uh, stations should be built. So the city of Toronto is, is, is very ambitious. I may have mentioned that in the, in the beginning that many of our cities, including Toronto, have adopted very um, ambitious targets and in fact the city of Toronto wants to become net neutral by 2040 which is 10 years earlier than the rest of Canada and what that means uh, for the city because of course one third of greenhouse gas emissions comes uh, from uh, transit 30% uh, of our cars in Toronto should be electric by 2030. Yet what we see from the data here is that we have only 2.4% in Toronto that are currently EV. And that is significantly below, of course, places like California, which is the best practices when it comes to EV adoption. And even our own Canadian peers, like the city of Montreal and city of Vancouver. This is just another way to showcase that at the present time, as of June 20, 
2022, we've only had about 1,400 public charging infrastructure stations across the city. We really do need to uh, accelerate our progress. By 2030, the target is around 16,000. And so the good question for, for all of us, and of course for municipality, for the city and, and others, how are we going to get uh, to that target? We see also on this chart that um, you know, capital expenditures or capital costs are significant. They range anywhere from 1,500 to about um, 200,000 uh, per EV charging station. And uh, the funding question again is, isn't really clear where exactly is this funding going to come from? From the earlier slides in this presentation, I really made the case, I hope I made the case that the city is, is running, um, I don't want to say deficit, it can do it by legislation, but certainly is facing a very tough fiscal situation. However, there are continuous pressures, including uh, this uh, environmental uh, objective that the city committed to hit by 2040, and how exactly we're going to be able to reach 16,000 uh, EV charging station in the city by 2030, and how, who and how uh, the city is going to pay for that uh, expenditure is, is really not clear. So I think it's a great opportunity a, for, for most of us to be involved in, in producing the business case, uh, helping with um, funding requirements and really continuously making the case uh, for, for more funding, either from other levels of government or private sector sources. So I'll, I'll move on to the next case study, which is related to government uh, services digitization and complex procurement, and I will make the case as to why consultants uh, can be supporting uh, this uh, direct direction as well. So what's, what's interesting is, you know, in the post-pandemic uh, world, uh, this survey was done uh, by Interact uh, as of 2021, I believe, and was basically, it was basically about 1,000 Canadians that participated in this survey, uh, 75 percent said that government services should be accessible online instead of in person and it is something i i long long time suspected that this is the case but i think because of the pandemic this is a much much higher sort of anticipation from canadians that we need to basically stay home be able to access you know whatever that whatever it is that we need to access to renew our passports, for example, to be able to not having to go to uh, Ontario service, uh, service Ontario, for example, kiosk, not having to stay in line and uh, being able to do that from the comfort of our home. Of course, we're looking for, for that service to be secure, uh, done in a very efficient uh, way uh, and having the a very good opportunity to kind of inter uh, interact with the interface of that service so that it's easy for us to navigate. So I, I, I hope that you know this, this particular element, this particular survey funding uh, was helpful because at the end of the day, Canadians don't really differentiate between who does what in Canada in terms of which level of government provides what type of services. But if we just look at the federal government alone, uh, we know that uh, federal government spends close to $9 billion annually on IT-related procurement in both products and services. And of course, I believe, I think many others, technician, believe that the government should not be in the business of delivering, um, uh, should be in the business of delivering core, service, core services to Canadians and should be buying IT-related products and services from uh, tech firms. Luckily, Canadian economy is, is very well diversified. Uh, we now also have a very good presence in our IT sector. We have over 40, 44,000 firms uh, uh, that are representing the ICT sector in Canada. And of course, I mean, it, it's, the, the size is always an issue, but 97% of those firms are small and medium enterprises with employment under 50 people. Uh, but they're all 
capable and, uh, and looking forward to uh, supplying uh, their products to governments. And the government at the same time recognizes that this is an opportunity to source uh, locally uh, driven innovation uh, from our Canadian companies. And they're reforming uh, their procurement processes in terms of allowing for diversification uh, of who is exactly procuring those services to them. So they're looking to include micro businesses and minority led businesses in the procurement mix. Um, they're also adjusting uh, their uh, uh, procurement processes to include more agility in that process, more feedback, uh, working with the, with the consulting industry much more closely in terms of defining the requirements, in terms of getting to the opportunity where they can get a really good sense of um, you know, the capability of the consultants to deliver a particular product or service. So there's a lot of interaction um, that is happening already. And I, I still, but you know, all of this said, recognizing there's a huge need, uh, there's a supply and demand that is there. Uh, still, I think the process, um, specifically at the federal level, because I'm much more familiar with the federal level, can be significantly improved uh, from the procurement standpoint. And this is an opportunity for uh, management consultants to help navigate uh, companies uh, throughout the procurement process, help with funding applications, and uh, also track uh, different uh, uh, RFPs and RFIs and RFQs throughout the public uh, uh, procurement databases. One of them is a buy and sell database. And I know that Sandra uh, probably could, could post this in uh, kind, of, kind of the text, text uh, uh, for you to see access to this uh, database. Uh, there is another one that is basically, it takes a subset of procurement opportunities and that has been developed by technician. Uh, so that, that is a really good source of information you guys can use. It's free of charge if you even if you are in, in interested in terms of delivering your products and services in IT, you could also get your company listed on this database so that you would be getting very targeted solicitations. Um, and again, business case always needs to be made um, to governments uh, and also from the companies to, uh, to the governments that they can be there and provide that type of service. And so management consultants can help help support with our IT process and business uh, case uh, development. So I certainly don't want to, you know, <laughs> I don't want to sound like a procurement specialist, I'm not. I just sort of have a, a high level understanding of how procurement works at the federal uh, and provincial level. Uh, but I know a few organizations, uh, including Invest Ottawa, that provides those types of uh, webinars uh, for free. So if you're further interested in exploring procurement opportunities with the government of, of Canada, I would really uh, like to encourage you to register for upcoming webinars uh, on September 15th and September 22nd. Uh, in particular, I know Sandra is posting a link um, to these uh, events, and I think there are a few other events that you can also uh, attend free of charge. Uh, so today, I wanted to kind of make the case for continuous learning for uh, management consultants, emphasize professional development, micro-credential, and networking. Without intelligent consultants, they cannot be intelligent cities. That's, that's my strong belief. I think intelligent cities would greatly benefit from support of, of management consultants, as I uh, mentioned earlier in my presentation. Uh, we need to stay on top of uh, macro trends like trend electrification, digitization of government services uh, to stay successful. Um, and also we can help navigate very complex uh, procurement uh, processes, although they're being sort of modified and improved, but there's still some, some work uh, to be done, and I think we certainly can help uh, uh, municipalities with applying for, for those procurement opportunities and, and small and medium enterprises as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, connect with you. This is my contact information. I'm happy to connect with you by email or by phone. 
And if you're thinking of applying for uh, student procurement uh, options or RFPs, happy to uh, partner with you. I also included some information about my company. I work for a boutique management consulting firm based in Toronto, and I specialize in providing business case analysis, survey and data analytics, government relations, project and event management, and strategic planning. Uh, uh, this is just a little bit of background about me. My bis business partner, Victor Mosgin, and um, just a bit more information about my services. Uh, so I know that this information will be available after the presentation. Uh, I also believe this presentation is being recorded. So you'll have access um, to, to this um, deck a, a bit later on. And I wanted to conclude by you know, thanking you for participating today. That we really mentioned that, look, I, I constantly learn and improve my skill sets. And yesterday, in fact, yesterday, uh, just, just only like a few years, basically 24 hours ago, I was in a webinar that was delivered by John Lawrence, uh, who is a former City of Toronto uh, reporter. I think he is now with the Golden Mail. Uh, he was in fact on the topic of smart cities and uh, he spoke about smart cities in his recently um, published book. Um, it's called, Pub sorry, I, I can't seem to remember the name of the book, but it's, it's, it's fantastic. I started reading it yesterday and it really, really creates a good uh, uh, case for why uh, intelligent cities can, can help transform municipalities and help Canadian cities deliver better services uh, to citizens. I thank you for your attention and I'll turn things over to Greg. Hey, thank you, Natasha. We'll, uh, we'll track down that, that author uh, shortly for, uh, for everybody. I got a question from uh, Greg Graham. Uh, he says, interesting that uh, London, um, the pre-Brexit financial center of Europe, has the least number of revenue sources, according to the chart that you showed. Um, sure that the concept of adding more sources of taxation during the current stressed economy will not be popular. How do cities sell this, given that all other taxes will probably rise to pay off COVID and economic stimulus spending debt? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah. Um, I look. I I can just maybe just sort of brainstorm a little bit uh, with you right now on this on this uh, topic. But what's interesting? Uh, I've heard um, a very similar discussion with respect to how the city of Toronto can continue to diversify its revenue sources, especially now in the context of rising taxes. Uh, Craig, I think you're, you're quite right. Uh, we have recently elected. Uh, and a new conservative leader, I think he's very focused on um, actually the opposite, the reduction in taxes, but the current government is very much interested in, I think, uh, improving uh, the government's uh, budget, the budget deficit, addressing the budget deficit, and how would this be tackled? I don't know. I think one of the ways is to increase taxes. But in the context of cities, um, I recently heard um, a candidate who is running for the city uh, election in October. As you know, October 22nd is the day to vote for the new city council. And he is very much in favor of levying um, a court and tax. So, you know, I think the jury is still out. Are we, are we ready as a city to, you know, levy taxes on personal cars, discourage people from driving to the city? or certain areas of it. I don't know exactly how it's going to work. I don't think he went into details on that, but it's apparently it's gaining momentum. This is an idea that was uh, discussed. Um, I think it was a global news reporter that was meeting with this candidate. And uh, I think the jury is still out on that one. Well, I, I personally am a big, big believer in, in creating solutions that provide economies so there's ways in which the cities could potentially save some of their expenditures in certain areas and be able to, uh, you know, move some of those monies into other areas. And I think that smart cities, uh, with the the way AI is moving now, um, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities to actually help cities save money or or use their existing funds more efficiently. Uh, myself. Um, from Louise Harris, she's asked, has PPP been considered anywhere for charging stations? 
Louise, I, I think this is a, a super, super question. I think, honestly, it's the only way. It's the only way that there has to be some sort of a way to, um, to get into those agreements, you know, with maybe financial institutions, maybe with credit unions, and basically agree on those terms because the, the city alone or the tr Toronto Parking Authority alone, unfortunately, is not in a position uh, to pay uh, for that massive expansion of electrification infrastructure, sorry, um, charging infrastructure in the city. So it, I think the only the only way it could work is through the public-private partnership uh, with the private sector. Right, and Albert um, Floatman uh, has you know just mentioned that the parallel issue of the changing role of local government in society, senior government downloading and growing citizen expectations are are all affecting these budgets and senior government funding, uh, as you've mentioned can be unreliable. Um, is there a guaranteed revenue stream from provincial funds? Uh, are some of the yes. provinces sort of stepping up here? Yeah, Craig, I think it's, it's again, it's a good question. I think in the context of Ontario, uh, we recently went for a very interesting uh, case study with, with respect to uh, the province actually uploading responsibilities uh, to itself for paying for four new uh, transit uh, related expansion projects. Right. But the, I mean, again, this is okay, capital expenditures, that's great. That's that's a lot of money, and, and you know, the senior level of government is stepping up. But the maintenance and operations, it is still residing mainly with the city. That's municipal government that is responsible for that state of, uh, state of good repair that I talked about in, in one of the earlier slides. So yes, I mean, part of, part of, I think you could, you could argue that in some areas, the government made it a lot easier for the city to be able to, to at least not having to pay for the new um, uh, transit infrastructure, but then operating and maintenance expenditures still very much for the city. Now, it's, it's my understanding Ontario Centre of Innovation uh, centered in Toronto has a budget of $360 million uh, for projects that people can propose to them. Here in Ottawa, you mentioned Invest Ottawa. They have the Bayview Yards. It's a hub in a lot of uh, cities across Canada, uh, large cities across Canada with the help of the provincial governments um, and probably federal money as well, um, have uh, innovation hubs. You'll see them uh, sometimes affiliated with the universities. Canadian Innovation Centre, for example, um, out east in British Columbia, has a small business accelerator program at UBC. So there are all kinds of areas, um, Albert, um, and whoever else has been looking you know, for that question, um, all kinds of areas where they've got money put aside and they're waiting and they are waiting for proposals. So you know, if you have some ideas, if your clients work in areas where some of these ideas um, could apply to them, I think that's where you get engaged as a management consultant and you start connecting the dots. And um, I think it's going to, I think there's lots of opportunity there. Um, Craig, and I also wanted to jump in. I think it was um, previously called Super Cluster Initiative at the federal level. And of course, what's interesting is that I buy in into a lot of criticism. I, you know, on the other, on one hand, on the other hand, I also understand, look, it's, it's an ambitious program. It takes a lot of time to set it up, so you can't expect, you know, very quick results and, and very quick ROI. But one of the key challenges, and I think the Logic magazine covered it really, really well, is that it isn't really the, the funding that is the problem. It's really the flow of funding. To your earlier point, look, they haven't flown all of those funds uh, to municipalities or to private sector the way that they were expected to do that. Why? Because they set up very complicated uh, procurement processes, oh, yeah. uh, a lot of red tape. I'm sure most of you can relate to, to that statement is like red tape upon red tape upon red tape, procurement, traditional waterfall that doesn't necessarily work um, you know, for, for most of us just because we are then expected to set aside, you know, minimum of one week of, uh, you know, time to basically be able to respond to RFP and it's not a guaranteed uh, opportunity. So oh, a lot of time is no. being wasted. 
I think. Well, oh yeah, but again, it's an opportunity for for those who can work through that paperwork to help uh, get to the exactly. end. Hey, a good question here. Um, we had talked earlier, you and I, about uh, Google and their their data that's available. So what about the legacy of their Sidewalk Lab project that was canceled in 2020? How has that impacted uh, Intelligent Cities? Um, Craig, it's a great question. And I unfortunately, I think I have to declare my bias because I was at the Board of Trade uh, promoting, uh, the, you know, basically this project uh, from an economic development lens. And uh, we, we have done tons of work in terms of understanding the public opinion. And the reality of what we found, uh, we've done this work in, in collaboration um, with um, uh, one of the polling companies. And what we found is that Canadians are not opposed to these types of projects. It's really the, um, the proof is in the pudding. Essentially, they were looking for the right conditions to be in place, for the data uh, to be protected, uh, having a really good sense of who is going to access and monetize this data, where exactly is it going to be stored, what type of relationship will, it, will there be between Sidewalk Labs and Google, um, and a lot of governance related discussion that wasn't just something that was addressed by the company. Um, and what was interesting is that, you know, the legislation, even at the federal level, with, with respect to privacy framework, um, hasn't really been updated for over, I think, two decades. So unfortunately, this, this project came to Toronto at a, probably too early, probably not, we were not, you know, as a society quite ready uh, to get this project going because we didn't really have the proper framework in place for privacy. I think a lot of these questions were not necessarily answered by the company as to what their business model is going to be. And so a lot of engagement with the public, I was part of those uh, discussions, but unfortunately the, the model wasn't really quite articulated. Uh, and of course, then the recession, sorry, the recession, the COVID-19 hit. And I think it was more of a potential look. look I, I think I give up because it's just way too complicated uh, to do anything in, 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 in Canada. But I think the reality of it is that we've learned a lot of lessons. I think we collectively, I think in Toronto, we certainly now know what we're looking for in our next opportunity. And I think when, when the conditions are created with all of the right um, elements in place around privacy, data access, data sharing, and what exactly is the problem that we're trying to solve, I think that will really help us uh, in terms of attracting the next the next project, big project to Toronto or uh, any other city uh, in Canada. I mean, Montreal, Vancouver, Ottawa, uh, it's, just in, in, it's just incredible to see that, that momentum with respect to intelligent and smart cities in me, those communities. To me, I think we have to, um, as, as senior consultants or any kind of uh, advisors, uh, when we get involved in the discussions of uh, public data or data that can be made public. I think the open data concept is, is really something that we need to push. We need to push out as much data as, we, as can be made public possible because then people with ideas can use that data, whether it's uh, uh, geological data or, or, or the Google um, mapping types of data. Um, there was a, a project here in Ottawa a few years back, and I'd like to see it happen more often in other cities. Maybe you can comment on this. Um, they had kind of like a bake-off contest where software developers could would get engaged in presenting solutions using uh, the municipal data for garbage collection. Uh, there's also now we have data, you know, for, uh, for traffic cameras, e-bikes, charging hubs, uh, you name it. All, a lot of this information can be easily made available in open data sources. And, and then, um, you know, innovative folks can start to utilize that data to provide solutions to, uh, to us, the public. And a lot of those solutions can be funded um, through startup monies, but then, but then can be maintained through small advertising, can, you know, a little bit of social media marketing that's tied with the, uh, with the advertising on these apps. I, th I think there's a huge future in this area. Um, have you heard of any um, bake-offs, things like that coming up? <laughs> uh, well, it, I think what you're talking about is more sort of um, at the community level, right? Like more kind of a bottom-up type of challenges when the community gets together 
and uh, helps to sort of solve for those big public policy issues. Um, again, at my at my time when I was at the uh, Toronto Region Board of Trade, we really advocated on reforming the way that the city uh, does its procurement. And one of the key elements that we recommended, and I'm I'm glad to see that that other cities like Edmonton and I think it was Calgary that have adopted those elements, is related to startup and residence program. So basically, it's a municipal municipally run program where the city articulates key challenges uh, to the startup community or scale up community, and then basically procures an opportunity from a few firms to basically come in, uh, stay with the city for about the duration, I think is about six months, if I'm not mistaken, and really help solve this problem uh, by having access uh, to all of the city staff, having access to the city data, Craig, you mentioned that's open data, but you know, if, if for some reason some data is not open, then they can be basically in, you know, working side by side with city officials and helping to define that issue. And I think it gained um, traction at some point across Canadian municipalities. I know the city of Guelph uh, was uh, leading this uh, this this um, opportunity with their own startup and residence. I think town of Innisville, uh, I mentioned town of Edmonton that actually formally adopted the startup and residence program uh, and joined this network. Of, of cities in North America and Europe um, that they now are also able to sort of exchange ideas and uh, have opportunity to tap into those civic challenges articulated by the city staff and then join uh, as a team uh, to essentially help solve for those problems. And if, if the solution is successful, the city typically buys that service. So that, that's, I think it's an opportunity. I think it's, it's good to see a lot of momentum, I think, right now, because there's so many challenges. Uh, but I think the, the 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 key kind of a message here is that the city itself needs to reform its own procurement uh, to allow for that type of experimentation, if you will. Uh, we got one last question here from uh, Dorothy uh, Milburn Smith on on the PPPs again. How does one handle the development and operation of these PPPs? Maybe you can just explain all the P's in the PPPs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's basically private-public partnership. Okay. Um, and I think it's it's a really, really good question, Dorothy. I think you're much more of an expert than I am in, in this. I mean, there's an army of consultants that just does uh, the, 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 the P3 partnerships. And I know um, the case uh, has been used success, successfully in terms of delivering transit, transit infrastructure. One could argue that 407 example was a successful one because that was done on a, a fee free basis. Others could, could probably, I'm sure there are many other examples where, you know, the, the service was done in, in basically, essentially what that, what that is, is that the public sector transfers the risk for that particular project. I think it was a tra uh, not TransLix, sorry, MetroLink's um, Crosstown LRT that was basically being delivered by a consortium of private sector companies that they had to be, you know, they had to deliver it on the scope, on budget, on time. And if they miss the timeline, there is a fine, you know, like, so, so it's, it's, I think it's a great opportunity. I think it's being used extensively in transit to my knowledge, but that's not to say it should not be used in digital technology. Well, you know, my answer to that question is hire a CMC. Exactly. And <laughs> they will help you take care of that. I want to thank you, Nat Natasha, for your presentation today. Uh, really in enjoyed it and enjoy uh, discussing the Q's and A's with you. Thanks to everyone attending today. Um, thank you also to our events coordinator here in CMC Ontario, Sandra Addison Brock. We're going to have to buy her a new operating system for her computer, apparently. Um, but then again, you know, that happens to everybody every now and then. Uh, but Sandra's always doing a great job in the background. Thank you. Uh, What's Up Wednesday is back next month. In fact, uh, every second Wednesday of the month, we have uh, three great shows lined up, uh, one in October, one in November, and one in December. I think we have one more slide to show on those topics. Um, thank you. Uh, there, we, uh, there we go. And um, book your second Wednesday of the month, please, in your daytimer now. God bless the Queen. May she rest in peace. Have a great day, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>